Well, today we're going to be uh, looking at um, Mark chapter 6, and I'm going to read starting in verse 30. I'm going to be reading for the, from the English Standard Version. Uh, Mark chapter 6, hear now the word of the Lord. The, the apostles returned to Jesus and told him all they had done and taught. And he said to them, Come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And when they went away in the boat to a desolate place by themselves, now many saw them going and recognized them, and they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. And when it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place, and the hour is now late. Send them away to go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered them, You give them something to eat. And they said to him, Shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? And he said to them, How many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they had found out, they said, Five and two fish. Then he commanded them all to sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups by hundreds and by fifties, and taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the people. And he divided the two fish among them all, and they all ate and were satisfied, and they took up twelve baskets full of broken pieces and of the fish. And those who ate the loaves were five thousand men. Thus ending the reading of God's word. Uh, let's, let's ask the Lord's blessing on his consideration of this word today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we uh, look at your word today, uh, we ask that you would give us your spirit that we might have eyes that can see and ears that can hear, that we might see Jesus Christ even more clearly, and that we might even learn how to live before you uh, more faithfully. And we pray this in his name. Amen. Well, if I were to give a Bible quiz today, as I sometimes try to do with my grandsons once in a while, I sometimes will ask uh, different questions. And one question that we might ask is, how many parables would we find, or how many miracles, I should say, how many miracles would we find that are recorded by each of the four gospel writers? And if you said uh, one or two, I think you could be right with either answer because uh, one miracle that appears in every gospel is, of course, the miracle of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. But another miracle that's also recorded by each gospel writer, and perhaps only, the only other one, is this one that we've read this morning, the feeding of the 5,000. It's kind of interesting to think about that of all the other miracles Jesus um, does perform, the other gospel writers don't always include them. But this one they did, and perhaps there's some significance uh, for that. I don't know why, maybe, but it certainly should cause us to think we ought to read this with some care and see what the Lord wants us to learn from his word and specifically from uh, the actions that are taking place uh, in this, in this uh, account. We know in, this, uh, in, the, in the context here, that the disciples, it says in verse 30, have returned. And this is alluding to what's taken place earlier in the chapter, in, chapter, in verse 7 of chapter 6 of Mark's gospel. Jesus sends out the apostles two by two. He sends them out to proclaim the coming of the kingdom. Uh, in verse 12 it says, So they went out and proclaimed that people should repent. And in verse 13, And they cast out many demons and anointed many with oil who were sick and healed them. So they've been out, and they've had a measure of success by God's Spirit sending them along, and they come back to give a report to our, our Lord. And Jesus says to them, Come away by yourself, in verse 31, 
to a desolate place and rest a while. I think Jesus was going to take them on a little retreat to a time of solitude. Uh, he had some concern for them. He was concerned about the well-being of his disciples because they had been busy. Uh, in fact, so many were coming and going, it says here, that they had no leisure even uh, to eat. And so Jesus was concerned that the disciples not be worn out, and he wants to take them away. I, by the way, I think there is even a small application for us in this regard. We sometimes can find ourselves uh, busy with the, the whirl of life, and we can maybe forget to take time with the Lord. And it's, it's important for us to spend time uh, daily, regularly, with, uh, with our Savior, that we might uh, meditate upon his word and, 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 and be, with, med, be in prayer with him. So it's important to do that. But Jesus had that concern for his disciples. And so he's, he's going to, uh, they get into a boat and they are headed off to a certain uh, desolate location, a place that would be one of solitude. Now they're on the Lake of Galilee. If you know something about the geography of that, that lake is about 14 miles long and seven miles wide. And it's somewhat surrounded by a, a, a basin of hills. So if you go up onto the shore and a little bit away from the lake very far, you can get a vantage point where you can see the boats uh, crossing over on the lake. And, and I, I suspect that was the case of these who saw the disciples going with uh, Jesus on this particular occasion. They see where he's, they can predict perhaps their, the destination point and they start making their way to that point by foot. It says that they're, uh, they're going there from the towns. And in fact, they're going so fast, they actually arrive there ahead of the disciples and Jesus. When the, the time comes for them to arrive at the, at the shore, um, there, there are many there standing there. So in other words, even though Jesus had in, in mind a time of solitude, the impact of his ministry had been so great that so many were interested in, in seeing him and being with him that they, 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 uh, they, 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 they are thronging on to this, this place where Jesus arrives on the shore. And so um, as Jesus gets out of the boat, uh, we see in verse uh, 34 that he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And so that's our first, perhaps, point today that we'll want to think about just for a few moments, the compassion of our faithful shepherd. Jesus is our faithful shepherd, and he demonstrates his compassion uh, to them because he sees these people as, as if they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he begins to immediately to teach them. And if we look at Matthew's account we find that there were many who were ill as well, and he was also performing many healings as well on this occasion. Now, it's, it's easy to imagine uh, these who are gathering there as they're rushing in. Uh, they probably were wearing light-colored clothing, which would be common for that part of the world. We know it's a grassy area. We learned that later in this text. There is a grassy area. It's, it's even, even somewhat... Um, possible to imagine that these who are rushing down, coming across this grassy area, might have even looked like sheep a little bit. Uh, and they were somewhat disorganized. There was no real order there. Um, there was no discipline. They were people that were in great need. They needed to be taught. They needed to be cared for. And so they were uh, really very much like sheep who were out with, uh, they were wandering without any, any help, and they were therefore uh, greeted, indeed, by a Savior who had compassion upon them. So we give thanks, of course, that our Savior who had compassion on his sheep does have compassion on each one of us as well. Now, what was the problem in some sense? Why, did, why was there no, no uh, shepherd? And that perhaps brings us to my second point here, the problem is that they had leaders, but they were really false leaders. Uh, if we were to go through the Gospels, we'd find uh, again and again Jesus speaking uh, to the Pharisees, speaking to the scribes. He'll do it in the very, uh, very next chapter in, in Mark's Gospel. 
and their leadership was really not biblical. They were not teaching the Word of God. They were not leading them in greater holiness, but rather they were, they were burdening, they put burdens on them of traditions, burdens of man-made regulations. And so their, their leadership was really a false leadership. There was also no leadership from the politicians of that day. I think there is some significance. We don't have time to go into it in great detail, but the account of, of Herod, King Herod uh, beheading John the Baptist occurs just before uh, this account. I think if we were to spend a little more time on it, we could see that I think John wants us to see a contrast between a godly king, the Lord Jesus Christ, and an ungodly king, King Herod. King Herod's father was Herod the Great. If you remember, Herod the Great in Matthew chapter 2 met with the wise men. And because of that meeting, he had all the young boys put to death. And because of that, uh, Joseph and Mary had to flee with baby Jesus to Egypt for a time. Uh, Herod the Great's uh, grandson was, was uh, Herod Agrippa. And in Acts chapter 2, we find that Herod Agrippa's is put to death because of his blasphemy. So uh, King Herod uh, is exhibiting uh, many of the sinful tendencies of his family when, of course, um, he uh, puts uh, uh, John the Baptist uh, to death, and as, as it's described in this passage here. And in doing that, of course, uh, one would not know how Herod might react. But Herod asked this question, or was, was wondering, and I'm sure he said, um, Herod, it says in verse 14, King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some said, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. Others said, he is Elijah. And others said, he is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. I'm sure in Herod's mind is, who is this that I hear of, this, name, this man who is named Jesus? What is he and who is he? Um, so, we have a, a false leaders in the, in the spiritual, spiritual leaders. Also, we have, of course, unreliable, unreliable political leaders. Uh, Herod had been a friend of the rich. He had thrown lavish parties. He had, had he called for John to be beheaded. He indulged himself, but he ignored the people, whereas Jesus stood in marked contrast to all the leaders of his time. Uh, and so... Jesus is the only true and good shepherd. And that, I believe that's really what's going to give us uh, a central teaching that we're going to take away from this passage, that Jesus Christ is our good shepherd. Well, uh, not only is Jesus showing compassion, but he also seeks to teach his disciples. And we see that in uh, verse 35 when we read that, when it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, this is a desolate place. And we see here that it's getting late. We also see that uh, the, the crowd is not really uh, getting ready to leave. They're not in any hurry to go anywhere. It doesn't look like Jesus Christ is going to draw this uh, to a, a close very soon either. And so the disciples... Uh, recognizing that there's really no convenience stores around, there's no food trucks down the street. Uh, he uh, urges Jesus to send the people away, send them to the villages that they might buy something. And what Jesus says to them is, you give them something to eat. But he doesn't provide any further guidance or instruction. Now, we might think, you know, the disciples had recently been authorized by the Lord to go forth and to teach and, to, and call people to repentance and had given them some authority over demons and to heal individuals. But perhaps in this situation, the, the, the magnitude of the, the, of, the, of the circumstance was too great for them to even think how they could do anything. It was just too large. In uh, Matthew's gospel, uh, we have the further information that there were 5,000 men, not including the women and children who were present. And so some commentators th think that maybe there could be as many as 15,000 people present on this occasion. And Jesus is telling them, you feed them. Well, 
you can see what their response is uh, after they ask how many loaves do you have. And, or sorry, before that, in verse, in verse 37, uh, they say, shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? Now, if you look in the footnote in your Bibles, it, it, most, most of the time it'll say that, that, that a denarius was a day's wage for a laborer. So 200 days wages, about eight months of wages, and they didn't have that kind of, of uh, funding on hand. And, and even so, the logistics, even if they did, would be uh, somewhat impossible given the circumstances. And so um, they, they are probably baffled. We can hear that bafflement in their, in their response to, to our Lord. So Jesus was really uh, asking them to do something that they couldn't do. In John's account, uh, the Gospel of John in chapter 6 and verse 6, uh, we learn something more, uh, which is maybe is implicit here. It tells us that Jesus said this to test them, for he himself knew what he would do. See, Jesus was asking them to do something that he knew they couldn't do. He knew that they could only do it with his strength. They could only do it if they were trusting in him. He knew what he was planning to do, but he wanted to see he wanted his disciples to see that they could not do it of their own strength. You know, this is sometimes true of us as well. The Lord sometimes puts us in circumstances that are too difficult or too large uh, to, to uh, work out on our own. Uh, I like this uh, quote uh, in the Reformation Heritage Bible, the study version of that Bible. It says on this text, Christ often asks us to do things that are impossible from our perspective so that we may learn his all-sufficiency through difficulty, faith, and prayer. Sometimes the Lord puts us in difficult circumstances to, to, in order to test us, in order to cause us to grow. I think there's probably three different ways that we, most of us will respond when we're put into a really difficult position. Sometimes when it's very difficult, we'll look at it and we'll just uh, despair. We'll give up. We think we can't do it. I think that's probably the, the response that the disciples are exhibiting on this particular occasion. They've, in effect, just given up. They're saying, Jesus, send them away. We can't do anything. And that, that can be the case for us as well. Uh, sometimes, though, we, we take almost the opposite approach. When we we're put into a very difficult position, we might uh, try to, in our own strength and our own efforts, maybe with some frantic activity, we try to solve a problem ourselves. We go about rushing around, seeing if we can figure out a way uh, to sort it out. It might be, a, it might be a, a problem at work. It might be a problem with our, someone in our family. It might be something we've done, and we're trying to figure out how to, how to, how to work our way out of that problem. But we don't do it. If we don't do it with the Lord, it's, it often isn't very successful. And so uh, the, the third way, of course, I would submit to you that we should be doing when we are placed in the situation like the disciples were is to trust in the Lord. We need to bring it to our Lord, seeking him, asking, O oh Lord, to grant to us a wisdom that we might respond as we do our duty. In the very last verse of uh, Psalm 90, it's the prayer of Moses. The very last verse says this, Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. And the idea there is, of course, that we need to trust the Lord, but we, we need to also trust the Lord that he will do things in such a way so that even the work of our hands will be for, fruitful and productive uh, for, and for his glory. Well, we, uh, that brings us to the, uh, to the fourth and final point uh, today, which is to see in this text that Jesus is the faithful shepherd. Uh, the disciples can only see five loaves and two fish, and, uh, but Jesus knows what he's going to do, and he's going to demonstrate, of course, that he is the faithful shepherd. In, uh, in, in uh, one way, this passage is a fulfillment of an Old Testament uh, passage in Ezekiel chapter 34, 23, which states, and I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he shall feed them, he shall feed them and be their shepherd. 
Now, of course, Ezekiel wasn't referring to King David. King David had been dead for 400 years. He was referring to the future coming king, the, the Lord Jesus Christ, and he would be the, the, the great shepherd. And so on this occasion, of course, we see that working out in a very real way. Jesus is not simply a shepherd, of course, in a, in a, in a physical way. He's a shepherd that feeds us spiritually as well. But it is a real example of a, of a fulfillment of that testimony. So Jesus uh, has the people in verse 39 sit down in groups. The word there, sitting, by the way, is, is really recline. It's the word that's used uh, to describe the way that people uh, at this time in ancient times would eat often at a banquet. They would recline, sometimes on banquet uh, couches. Uh, it's actually much the same idea that we have in mind when we read the account in John's Gospel of the, of the Passover supper that Jesus celebrates with his disciples in the upper room. They were, they were reclining around the table there. So Jesus asks the people to recline, to sit down. And so they're prepared, preparing, of course, to eat. And um, there's another aspect here that sort of makes a reference to the, um, to the uh, time of the exile because he has them sit down in, uh, in groups of hundreds and fifties. And uh, really this uh, reminds us of the time when in, in, uh, during the exile God ex instructs Moses to organize the people of God in this way. Uh, we find that in more than one place, but in Exodus 18, verse 21, it says, Moreover, look for able men from all the people, men who fear God, who are trustworthy and hate a bribe, and place such men over the people as chiefs of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties, and tens. And so in a, in a very similar way as in Exodus, uh, the people are, are organized by these groups. And then, of course, very much like in Exodus, um, God feeds uh, them bread even as he fed the Israelites manna from heaven. So the people uh, recline, they sit down in those groups, and in verse 41 it says, he takes the five loaves and the two fish, looked up to heaven, said a blessing, and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples. And the, the word that is translated gave in the ESV is, is, is imperfect, which has a sense of a continuous ongoing giving. And so in the giving of the bread, as, God, as, as Jesus breaks the bread, as he breaks the fish, there is a, a multiplying, a, a continual giving of bread. And we see that there was enough to cer certainly more than satisfy everyone. Um, there, they, they ate and they were satisfied. And in fact, uh, it was really a, a very much a, a remarkable uh, a remarkable miracle when we think about it that 15,000 people perhaps were satisfied and there was yet there was something left over there were 12 baskets the 12 disciples went forth with baskets to gather up the leftovers Mark doesn't give us any assessment of what the crowd thought of this it's kind of interesting to think that it comes to it's such a remarkable miracle there's nothing that's actually said about it we do know that in John's gospel that at this moment in time uh, the response of the crowd was was not all was not completely right they wanted to make him cr king on the spot they wanted to crown him king but probably for the wrong reason they wanted uh, probably a king who could provide food uh, and so that would not be the right reason to crown Jesus uh, but it is a remarkable thing and even the disciples didn't really fully understand what's going on if you look further down the chapter in verse 42, or verse 52, um, after Jesus walks on the water, uh, it says, for they did not understand about the loaves, for their hearts were hardened. They had still not understood, even after this great and remarkable uh, miracle, uh, what Jesus was attempting to do. Uh, as I mentioned earlier in this chapter, we, we might think that Herod was asking the question, uh, who uh, is Jesus. And, you know, some thought he was John the Baptist, some thought he was Elijah, some thought a prophet of, of old. But I think we really get the answer when we look at this miracle that, of course, he is the, the almighty son of God. He can do all things. 
and he is the good shepherd. He has compassion for his people. He can meet the needs of his people. He's the one who will soon go to the cross to lay down his life, to take upon himself the sins of his people, and to be raised again. And so our primary application and teaching, of course, today is to see uh, in this passage that Jesus is, is our compassionate shepherd. He has compassion for you. Uh, he has compassion uh, uh, for you no matter what your circumstances are. If you have never yet uh, placed your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, then, then today is a day that you should also believe in, and trust in him, that he is the one, he is the only one, only mediator between God and man. And as we place our faith in him, we find forgiveness of our sins. He takes away not only the guilt, but also the power of sin and he draws us into fellowship with himself. He, we become adopted as his children, and we cry out to him, Abba, Father. So he is our great shepherd. Uh, but we also learn in this passage, of course, as we are trusting in him day by day, we should learn also how to live when we run into those difficult circumstances, the unsolvable circumstances. The disciples... Uh, did not maybe learn it on that moment in time, only perhaps looking back, did they realize that they could not do uh, anything of their own strength, but with the trusting in Christ and putting their trust in him and doing what they are commanded to do, they can do what God wills. And that's the thing which we need to learn as well, even as we are placed into difficult circumstances day by day. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, uh, Moses is at the near, nearing the end of his life. The, the um, Israelites are about ready to go into the promised land, and he's giving uh, the final instructions uh, to the people of God. He gives them again, reminds them of the, of the Ten Commandments in chapter 5. In chapter 7, he tells them they need to be faithful to obey those commandments as well as other judicial commandments. And Moses said, that if you say in your heart, if you, if you have this doubt, if you say in your heart, these nations are greater than I, how can I dispossess them? Then you shall not be afraid of them, but you shall remember what the Lord your God did to Pharaoh and all, to all Egypt, the great trials that your eyes saw, the signs, the wonders, the mighty hand, and the outstretched arm by which the Lord your God brought you out. So will the Lord your God do all to the peoples of whom you are afraid." In other words, Moses was saying to them uh, the same thing that the disciples should be learning here in this case. When the problem seems too big, when you don't see a solution, uh, you should need to place your trust in him and remember what he has done before, that our Lord is sovereign and incapable of doing all things. In, uh, in fact, even Moses tells the people that he will give kings into your hand. That's Therefore, true even today, even as we look upon the, the things in our lives, we may, they may seem too difficult. Uh, the powers of evil may seem too great, but we need to place our faith and our trust in him. Now, there's one more thing to, to point out here. Um, as Jesus was instructing, his, um, the, instructing the people to recline in the grass, um, Sinclair Ferguson makes this interesting comment in his uh, commentary on this, on this passage of Scripture. He says, um, in, in, a, in a sense, it's, a, it's also a fulfillment of something else. David, the King David, wrote Psalm 23, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. And in some sense, that was being fulfilled even at this moment in time as Jesus was having the people recline in order to be ready to receive the bread. Uh, he was making them lie down in green pastures on the side of, this, uh, of, of the Sea of Galilee at the lakeside. And so it's a, it's a wonderful thing to, to, to meditate upon. Perhaps even some who uh, were dining that day and as they walked home would, would sing Psalm 23 with, with a new understanding. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we give thanks today that you give life in and through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that he is our 
faithful shepherd. We thank you that he came from the heights of heaven, and you have shown uh, your beauty in how he cared for those in great need, how he cares for us, and all that call out unto him in mercy, he does extend mercy. May it be that, O oh Lord, we would trust you more faithfully, enable us to serve you because of your promises to us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.